Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Pearson at Excel International A Level, Chemistry Unit 2 for October 2023. Let's begin with the first question. In question 1, the mean carbon fluorine bond enthalpy is plus 485 kilojoules per mole, which process has the enthalpy change of plus 1940 kilojoules per mole. So here I went through the calculations. We can see 1940 is the same as 485 times 4. It has to have four carbon fluorine bonds and therefore the answer is going to be a C. In question 2, which expression gives the standard enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole for the reaction shown? Here we can see this is thermodecomposition. So the enthalpy formation of barium carbonate from the elements, barium, carbon and oxygen, is negative 1 to 1, 6. Enthalpy formation of barium oxide, again from the elements, is that. And enthalpy formation of carbon dioxide, again from carbon and oxygen, is that. So if we are looking for that, it means we're going to reverse this to create a 1, 2, 1, 6. And then minus 5, 5, 4, minus 3, 9, 4. Two negatives and then the positive, so the answer should be A. In question 3, the standard enthalpy changes of combustion for a series of alkanes are shown. We have them here. They say another alkane has an enthalpy change of combustion of negative 6125 kilojoules per mole. What is the most likely formula for this alkane? This enthalpy change will be less exothermic than twice this one here. So it means the compound we are looking for or the substance should be less than 10 carbons. So the closest is going to be 9 carbons because if I multiply this by 2, that would be less exothermic than this. So the closest is going to be carbon 9, hydrogen 20, and that is what I chose. Which row in the table shows the forces between the molecules in the liquid state? So here, since they're all molecules, London forces will exist in all. But the permanent dipoles exist between those that have polar bonds, while hydrogen bonds are going to exist among those that can form intermolecular hydrogen bonds like ammonia. The only thing that marks everything correctly is hydrogen sulfide. It has London forces. It has permanent dipoles, but it does not have intermolecular hydrogen bonds. So this should be the answer. Remember for this one here, it doesn't have hydrogen bonds. This one here should have hydrogen bonds, so B and C were already wrong. And this one here should have London forces, so that leaves D. In question 5, which of these isoelectronic compounds would be expected to have the highest boiling temperature? The first one is butanoanol. This is an alcohol with four carbons. The next is 2-methylpropanoanol. This is an alcohol with four carbons, but it's branched, so branching decreases the boiling point in comparison to the first one, which is butanoanol. Also, this is branched, so it has a lower boiling point. And pentane, pentane only has London forces since it has five carbons which are closer to this. This is going to have the highest boiling point. They will have similar London forces because they are isoelectronic, but this can form extra due to the formation of hydrogen bonds, so it's going to have a higher boiling point. In question six, what is the value of n in the half equation shown? So here, when we look at this equation, which is given, we see in total we have four hydrogens on one side. It means that n should also be four because the hydrogens are only formed in the OH minus on the product side. So if this is four, it means C is going to be the answer. In question seven, which equation shows a disproportionation reaction? If you're looking for a disproportionation reaction, you should have one component on the reactant side and two components or two different oxidation states of that specific component on the product side. So here, for example, we have copper, but we have only copper in one. That is not disproportionation. Here we have iodine in one, but it's also present in one on the product side. There is no way that can be disproportionation. Here we have two different manganese oxidation states. But they're on the reactant side, while well, we have just one on the product side, so that can't be disproportionation. Here we have one sulfur-containing species on the reactant side and two different sulfur-containing species on the product side. So there is possibility of disproportionation here. And then we look at the oxidation states. This is plus 2, plus 4, and 0. And so that should be the disproportionation reaction. 
And then next, when sodium bromide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid, sodium hydrogen sulfate is already formed. What other products are formed in this reaction? So I wrote the reaction here, there's a bromide reacting with sulfuric acid. There is a possibility of formation of sodium hydrogen sulfate in a non-redox reaction as well as hydrogen bromide. But in a redox reaction, we can form sulfur dioxide as well as bromine. So the answer should be bromine, hydrogen bromide, and sulfur dioxide only. That should be C. And next, which property decreases as group two is descended? This is a decrease, atomic radius, this is gonna increase due to the more shells added. Reactivity of the elements is gonna increase because the electrons that are being lost are gonna be farther away from the nucleus or farther away from the center. They are easily lost. Solubility of sulfates, this is gonna decrease. Thermostability is gonna increase because there is a decrease in the polarizing power so more energy will be required to decompose the components. So the answer is gonna be C. In question 10, in a neutralization reaction, 20 centimeters cubed of 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed nitric acid reacts with 10 centimeters cubed, one mole per decimeter cubed aqueous sodium hydroxide. As you can see in this reaction here, they're asking you what is the concentration in mole per decimeter cubed of sodium nitrate solution produced. Using the information given here, that is the volume, that is the concentration for nitric acid. And then sodium hydroxide, that is the volume and that is the concentration. So we calculate the moles of each. So moles of nitric acid are going to be the concentration which we have here times the volume, giving us that. And the moles of sodium hydroxide are going to be still concentration times volume. But again, remember the volume has to be in decimeters cubed, we get that. These are equal moles, so there is nothing limiting, meaning the moles of sodium nitrate are also gonna be 0.01. So the concentration should be number of moles of a volume, which is 0.01, divided by the total volume. Here we have 20 plus 10, which is 30. So now 30 divided by 1,000. I'm dividing by 1,000 to convert it to decimeters cubed. So it comes out as 0.333 mole per decimeter cubed, which gives us A. In question 11, the equation for the reaction of sulfur dioxide with oxygen is shown, which is that, what is the effect of a decrease in temperature? Since this is a reversible reaction and the forward reaction is exothermic, if temperature is decreased, the position of equilibrium shifts to the exothermic side, which is the product side, and the yield of the product is gonna increase. So the rate will decrease because temperature has been lowered, but the yield of the products is gonna increase. So the answer should be a D. And then they say, what is the effect of increasing pressure? To know the effect of increasing pressure, we have to calculate the number of particles. On the right hand side, we have two plus one. These are three gaseous particles. And on the product side, we have two gaseous particles. So when we increase pressure, the position is gonna shift to the side with fewer gaseous molecules. And in this case, still is the product side. So the rate of reaction is gonna increase and the yield also is gonna increase. In question 12, a mixture of 1 cm cubed 0.2 mole per decimeter cubed potassium chromate 6 and 5 cm cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sulfuric acid forms the equilibrium shown. What would be the effect, if any, on the color of the solution if 5 cm cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide were added? This is sodium hydroxide. It's going to react with the hydrogen ions, decreasing their amounts. So the mixture is going to turn yellow since the position of equilibrium is gonna be shifted to the left-hand side. So here, C is the answer. In 13, tertiary alcohols are used in the manufacture of petrol additives. Which of these is a tertiary alcohol? A tertiary alcohol is one that has a carbon with OH attached to three other carbons. So if you can see here, this is just a two methyl, meaning there is a methyl on carbon two, but the OH is on carbon one. There is a 2 methyl betan 1 O still carbon 1, the OH is on carbon 1, and then 3 methyl pentan 2 O, the OH is on carbon 2, so this is going to be secondary. But 1 methyl cyclopentanol, this is already tertiary, so the answer should be A. And they say which reagent reacts with the tertiary alcohols? 
acidified aqueous potassium dichromate. This does not because tertiary alcohols are never oxidized. Bromine water will not. Phosphorus pentachloride, yes it will. And sodium carbonate, no. So the answer should be C. In 14, infrared spectra may be used to identify organic compounds. When propan2O is refluxed with excess acidified potassium dichromate, the product will show a peak due to. This is a secondary alcohol, but when we use acidified potassium dichromate, we're going to produce a ketone. So the product will show the peak due to a ketone, which is going to be a carbon oxygen double bond in ketones. So the stretch is going to be between 1720 to 1700 per centimeter. And that should be the answer if you use your data booklet. In 14b, when propan 1O is heated with acidified potassium dichromate 6, the product that is distilled off as it's formed will show the peak due to. This product is going to be an aldehyde. It's going to show a peak due to the carbon oxygen double bond stretch at 1740 to 1720 per centimeter due to aldehyde. Separate solutions of one chloropropane and one bromopropane in ethanol are warmed with aqueous silver nitrate. Why does the formation of a precipitate take longer with one chloropropane? If we look at the bonds involved, with one chloropropane, it's a carbon Cl bond, while here it's a carbon Br bond. This bond is weaker in comparison to that, so the weaker bond breaks faster. So the answer should be B. The carbon chlorine bond is stronger than the carbon Br bond. That's why this precipitate takes longer to be formed. In 16, a sample of propane 1,2-diol with a mass of 1.52 grams reacts completely with excess phosphorus pentachloride. What is the maximum mass in grams of the organic product? Because this has two OH groups, if it reacts completely, it means all the OH groups are going to be substituted with Cl, and the product is going to be that. So we're interested in the mass of that. Since we have the mass of this, Number of moles is going to be mass divided by molar mass, which gives us that. And the mole ratio is 1 to 1, so the number of moles of the product are going to be 0 0.02. So the mass is going to be number of moles times the MR of the organic product, which is 0 0.02 times 113, giving us 2.26 grams. And C is the answer. In 17, which compound reacts with ammonia to form this compound here? This is with ammonia, so it should be with a halogen here on this carbon. The halogen should be on carbon 2, so this is out. To chloropropane, of course, this is on carbon 2. These ones have no halogens, so we can eliminate that, and therefore the answer is going to be a B. Next, they say this question is about sodium hydroxide. Write an ionic equation for the neutralization reaction between aqueous sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. State symbols are not required. So because this is a neutralization reaction, the H plus in hydrochloric acid and the OH minus in sodium hydroxide are going to be neutralized to give us water. Then state what is meant by the standard enthalpy change of neutralization. Because we are talking about neutralization, we focus on the moles of water produced. So I say this is the enthalpy change at 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals when one mole of water is produced by a reaction between an acid and an alkali. And next, the student carried out an investigation to determine the enthalpy change of neutralization of aqueous sodium hydroxide by hydrochloric acid. So the method is as below. Separate 25 centimeters cube sample of 0.8 mole per decimeter cube sodium hydroxide and 0.8 mole per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid were left to reach room temperature. After two minutes, the solutions were mixed in a copper calorimeter and the temperature was noted at 30 second intervals. Use the graph shown to determine the maximum temperature change. In this experiment, you must show you're working on the graph. So let's go to the graph. I drew a line of best fit until the time when the reaction began because they've told us it's at two minutes. So a line of best fit until two minutes and the other side I drew a line of best fit through the data and then connected a vertical line from the time the reaction started until the point where the extended line of best fit from the other data met. So this means the maximum attained temperature is about 26.8 while the minimum is 22.4.
So my dt is going to be 26.8 minus 22.4, giving me 4.4 degrees Celsius. So here my dt should be 4.4 degrees Celsius. And next I say, calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization using your answers in A and B1. Give a sign and units with your answers. Assume no energy is used to heat the container. The specific capacity of the solution is given and the density of the solution of sodium hydroxide and HCl are one gram per centimeter cubed. So from the information given using Q is MC delta T, the mass is gonna be 50 since they use 25 of each and then the specific capacity is 4.2 and the DT was 4.4. So calculating I got 294 joules, but I have to convert it to kilojoules. And again, this shouldn't be negative here. I'm gonna delete that. So I got 0 0.924 kilojoules. Now the number of moles are gonna be, these are moles of the acid. The concentration is 0 0.8 times 25. This is in centimeters, but I multiply by 10 power negative three to convert it to decimeters, and I get 0 0.02 mole. So my delta H is gonna be negative Q over N, which is the negative of that, divided by 0 0.02, giving me negative 46.2 kilojoules per mole. This is an exothermic reaction, so I put a negative. If at all, the enthalpy change of neutralization obtained in B2 would differ if the heat capacity of the calorimeter was included in the calculation. If it was included, then we would expect the delta H to be more exothermic or the magnitude to be more negative. So I said if the heat capacity of the calorimeter was included, the enthalpy change of neutralization would be more exothermic because the calculations for the heat released would have included the energy required to heat the calorimeter before heat is transferred to the water. And in part C, aqueous sodium hydroxide reacts with one bromopropane to produce propan 1 o stay the type and mechanism of this reaction. This is reacting a halogen alkane with sodium hydroxide but under aqueous conditions, so this is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And next I say complete the mechanism for this reaction, include Kali arrows and relevant lone pairs and dipoles. So because OH is required here, I included OH with a minus and a lone pair also, the carbon BR bond is polar, so sigma plus and sigma minus. So these electrons are donated to the partially positive carbon, and then that bond goes away, with the BR taking both electrons to become bromide, and then this OH attaches onto the carbon to produce this compound here. Then they say under different conditions, sodium hydroxide reacts with one bromopropane to form propene. This is elimination, and the solvent used is going to be ethanol. So this brings us to the end of question 18. Let's continue to question 19. In question 19, this question is about some of the elements in group seven of the periodic table. Mixtures of halide salts are found in brine solutions extracted from oil and gas wells. Iodine, which is used as a dietary supplement, may be obtained from these mixtures. A brine solution containing 2.49 grams of a mixture of potassium iodide and potassium chloride was analyzed. So the procedure is as below. In step one, excess aqueous silver nitrate solution was added to the solution to completely precipitate the halide. So in this case, we're gonna produce a silver halide, which could be silver iodide and silver chloride since it contained both chloride and iodide. Then excess aqueous ammonia was added to the mixture. If we add excess aqueous ammonia, it means the chloride is gonna dissolve, but the iodide won't. Then they say the mixture was filtered and the solid was washed, dried and weighed. Because silver iodide will not be dissolved, it's the only solid that is gonna be left. And therefore, when we filter, we obtain the solid silver iodide since silver chloride will be in solution. They say the mass of the dried solid was 0 0.162 grams. Stay the color of the solid in step three. It's going to be yellow because it's silver iodide. And next is a calculate the percentage by mass of potassium iodide in the mixture. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures. The moles of silver iodide are going to be mass divided by the MR. The mass is obtained as 0 0.162 divided by the MR and I got this as the number of moles. So because silver iodide came from potassium iodide, they have the same number of moles. 
and therefore the mass of potassium iodide is going to be number moles times the MR of potassium iodide. These are the moles similar to those times the MR giving me 0 0.11453 grams and the percentage by mass is going to be 0 0.11453 divided by the original mass times 100 giving me 4.60 percent. And in part B, chlorine gas may be prepared by heating concentrated hydrochloric acid with solid manganese for oxide. They say show by reference to oxidation numbers that this is a redox reaction. Here I calculated the oxidation states. In here manganese is plus 4, it becomes plus 2, meaning that is reduction. In here chloride is minus 1 or chlorine as minus 1. We get chlorine as 0, that is oxidation. So I said manganese is reduced from plus 4 to plus 2. Chlorine is oxidized from minus 1 to 0. Since both oxidation and reduction occur, this is a redox reaction. And in part C, iodine may be obtained by bubbling chlorine gas through aqueous potassium iodide. When the reaction is complete, hexane is added and the mixture shaken. Two layers are formed. Stay the color of each layer. The aqueous layer is going to be yellow because iodine dissolved in the aqueous layer, which is going to be water, shows a yellow color. And the hexane layer is going to be purple. This is yellow and not brown because as you have the two layers together, more of the iodine is going to go into the hexane layer, creating a purple color. And this is going to lighten up, so it's going to be yellow, while this is going to be purple. And in part D, explain why iodine is more soluble in hexane than in water. By considering the intermolecular forces in iodine, hexane and water, and any intermolecular forces formed between iodine and the solvents. So in this case, we are considering iodine and iodine, meaning the iodine molecules alone, those only have London forces. Then we consider the hexane molecules alone, those also have London forces. Also the water molecules alone will have London forces, permanent dipoles and intermolecular hydrogen bonds. So putting iodine in water and putting iodine in hexane, the interaction between iodine and hexane is greater than the interaction between iodine and water because for greater solubility to be attained, the energy to separate the water molecules has to be compensated for when the iodine and water interact. But if it's not compensated for to a greater extent, then the solubility is going to be lower. So I say between iodine molecules, there are only London forces. Hexane molecules can also only form London forces with each other. However, water molecules can form London forces permanent dipoles and intermolecular hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the strongest intermolecular forces of attraction. The London forces formed between iodine molecules and hexane molecules are similar in strength, so can be overcome when iodine and hexane molecules come together, so they will dissolve in each other properly. In my demonstration here, I talk about the iodine molecules alone, the forces of attraction between them. And then here we have the hexane molecules, the forces of attraction between them. These require energy to be broken for separation to occur. This energy can be provided when the iodine and the hexane come together. The exothermic energy released when the two come together can compensate for the endothermic energy required to break the individual components. I'm talking about the solid solvent. I could say if this is the solid and this is the solvent, the forces of attraction between the solid and the forces of attraction between the solvent need to be broken. So the energy from the forces of attraction between the solid and the solvent is enough or is sufficient to break the forces between the solid and the forces between the solvent before they come to interact with each other. Since iodine can't form intermolecular hydrogen bonds, on interaction with water, not enough energy is released when water and iodine come together to overcome the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So solubility of iodine in water is hindered or is going to be lower in comparison to iodine and hexane. In question 20, this question is about carbon dioxide. Carbonate ions may be identified by their reaction with aqueous acid to produce carbon dioxide. Give the ionic equation for this reaction, this includes state symbols. So the ionic equation is going to be like that. 
And next they say a lime water, which is a solution of calcium hydroxide, can be used to test for the presence of gaseous carbon dioxide. State what would be seen when carbon dioxide is bubbled through lime water. The lime water is going to turn cloudy. And in part B, a student determined the solubility of calcium hydroxide in water by titration with hydrochloric acid. The equation for the reaction is as shown here. This is the procedure. Calcium hydroxide powder was added to distilled water and the mixture was stirred until no more solid dissolved. The excess solid was filtered off to leave a saturated solution. 25 centimeter cube portions of these solutions were titrated with 0.05 mol per decimeter cubed hydrochloric acid with phenolphthalein as an indicator until two concordant titers were obtained. The mean titer was 18.95 centimeters cubed. They wanted to calculate the concentration of the saturated solution in gram per decimeter cubed. I'm going to begin with the information given here. The number of moles for HCl are going to be concentration times volume. So 0 0.05 times 18.95 times 10 power negative 3. Converting this to decimeters cubed gave me those moles. Since the mole ratio is 2 to 1, the moles of calcium hydroxide are going to be half the moles of HCl, giving me that. And so the mass of calcium hydroxide will be number of moles times the MR of calcium hydroxide, giving me that times the MR. And multiplying, I get that. So the concentration will be mass divided by volume. And again, we're looking for concentration in gram per decimeter cubed. So it should be the mass in grams divided by the volume in decimeters cubed. So in the end, I got 1.40 gram per decimeter cubed. That is my answer to three significant figures. And next, I said the student used the same procedure to determine the solubility of strontium hydroxide. Explain whether or not the mean titer value for strontium hydroxide would be different from that of calcium hydroxide. Strontium hydroxide is more soluble than calcium hydroxide, so because it's more soluble, the mean titer would be higher. So I say the mean titer for strontium hydroxide would be higher because strontium hydroxide is more soluble in water than calcium hydroxide. So more hydroxide ions will be released and this will require more moles of acid for neutralization to occur. And again, you studied solubility of group two hydroxides. It increases as you go down the group. In part C, between 1960 to 2020, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rose from 320 parts per million to 420 ppm. The recent rapid increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide is affecting the chemistry of seawater. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form carbonic acid, which is that. They say the carbonic acid dissociates in water according to the equilibrium shown. So this is the equilibrium. Explain in terms of the equilibrium the effect of the increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide on the acidity of seawater. If the concentration of carbon dioxide in the water increases, then it means the acidity of the seawater is going to be increased because more carbonic acid is going to be formed. So I say as atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, more carbonic acid is formed and the equilibrium position is going to shift to the right, meaning more hydrogen ions will be released and the acidity of seawater is going to increase. So this brings us to the end of section B. Let's continue to section C. In question 21, this question is about some organic molecules which are important in the production of adhesives and coatings. Compound X is a liquid containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen only. A sample of X with a mass of 1.92 grams contains 1.08 gram carbon and 0.131 gram hydrogen. Use this data to calculate the empirical formula of X. The mass of oxygen is going to be 1.92 minus the total mass of the other two, because we have the mass of carbon and hydrogen, giving us that. The moles of carbon are going to be mass of carbon divided by the AR, or atomic mass, which is that. Moles of hydrogen is going to be mass of hydrogen divided by the atomic mass, giving us that. And moles of oxygen is going to be mass of oxygen divided by the atomic mass, giving us that. The mole ratio of carbon hydrogen to oxygen is 2 to 3 to 1, and therefore the empirical formula is going to be that. And next they say the mass spectrum of X is, we can see this here, 
And based on that, this is going to be the molecular mass, 86. They said deduce the molecular formula of X using the mass spectrum, and you answer in a 1. From the mass spectrum, the molecular mass is 86, so I'm going to use this in 86 to see if the empirical formula and the molecular formula are similar. So molecular mass is 86. I'm using N. N into carbon 2, hydrogen 3, oxygen is 86. So 24 for 2 carbons plus 3 plus 16 times N is equal to 86. And so N is equal to 2. So X is equal to carbon 4, hydrogen 6, oxygen 2. This is the molecular formula of that compound. Next, they say reagents were added to separate samples of X to identify the functional groups in the molecule. They say complete table 1. A reaction with bromine water and bromine water was decolorized. This shows that that compound contains a carbon-carbon double bond. An aqueous sodium carbonate, there was effervescence. It means the compound contains a carboxylic acid. So next they say using your answer in A3 and the mass spectrum, complete table 2. Since it has a carbon-carbon double bond and a carboxylic group, the carboxylic group should be at the end and it has four carbons, so it means the double bond cannot be here. It could either be here or there. Basically, the two possible compounds are here. But they say there is a mass to charge 41 and 145. The 45 is going to be due to the carboxylic acid. And then 41 is going to be due to the carbon 3, hydrogen 5 plus. And next they say X does not show geometric isomerism. Draw a possible displayed formula of X. If it does not show geometric isomerism, then it cannot be this. It's going to be that. So this is going to be the answer. And in part B, propanoic acid can be produced industrially from propane 1 to 3 triol. The first step is a dehydration reaction to convert gaseous propane 1 to 3 triol to propanol. This reaction requires a solid catalyst. This explains how a catalyst increases the rate of this reaction. Use the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shown and refer to the collision theory. So on the vertical axis, we have the number of particles and they've given us the activation energy. So when we use a catalyst, it provides a new pathway with lower activation energy. So the catalyzed one should have lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed one. And this means we're going to have more particles with energy equal to or greater than the activation energy and the rate of reaction is going to be faster, or there will be more successful collisions. So I said a catalyst provides an alternative pathway with lower activation energy, so a higher fractional molecules have energy equal to or greater than the activation energy. There is a higher chance of having successful collisions. And next they say propanol is then oxidized to propanoic acid. Write an equation for the reaction using O to represent the oxygen from the oxidizing agent. From above, this is going to be propanol. Again, this is an aldehyde, which is going to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid, so we need one mole of the oxidizing agent to produce the carboxylic acid. And in part C, one synthetic crude for the production of propanoic acid uses propane derived from crude oil as a starting material. Suggest suitable reagents and conditions for the conversion of propane to propane 1 2 diol. Here we can use acidified potassium manganate 7, and it has to be at room temperature. And lastly, suggest why the production of propanoic acid from propane 1 2 3 triol is more sustainable than its production from propane. So I said propane 1 2 3 triol can be made from material that is renewable while propane comes from fossil fuels that are not renewable. A reaction with propane 1, 2, 3, triol, and again this should be propane. To produce propanol only produces water as the byproduct. So this brings us to the end of section C, as well as to the end of this whole paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.